In only one week, we're taking this Mum's Taxi Spec 200 series and turning it into a vehicle that'll be able to drive this. Go, 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 you know it. What a drive! If you want to build your four-wheel drive to handle the toughest four-wheel drive action trips like we do, keep watching. This isn't like other build-up videos where people whack a bunch of parts on to make a four-wheel drive look and perform better. We're going to show you which mods and upgrades to do to your own four-wheel drive, but most importantly, we're going to show you why, in which order, and give you a heap of expert tips along the way so you can do this to your own four-wheel drive. We're going to prove that you can build a four-wheel drive that's a beautiful daily driver that can do the toughest tracks in the world and that you can live off the grid out of for weeks at a time with parts you can buy and most of them you can fit yourself in the driveway. To prove you can build any four-wheel drive up to do our kind of four-wheel driving, we're working with a team at Spares Box to build up their very own 200 series. However, all the tips you see in this video can relate to your own four-wheel drive. One week, three blokes and a whole bunch of gear from Spares Box. Can we take this stock four-wheel drive to be four-wheel drive action trip ready? Let's get into it. Before you do a single thing to your four-wheel drive, ask yourself the question, what are you going to use the vehicle for? The big 200's got to be able to drive some of the toughest tracks in the world, plus the boys have got to be able to camp out of it for long periods of time in remote areas. So with that in mind, let's look at some of the mods we've got to do to achieve this. You probably have a similar wish list in your head for your own four-wheel drive. But the biggest question is, what mod should I do first and what order should I do them? There is a bit of an order to do each mod in. For example, you can't choose your suspension lift height until you decide on what size tyres you're going to run. Also, you can't decide on things like spring rates until you know the rough weight of the accessories you're going to add. The first thing to decide is what size tyre should I run. The number one thing that will get you further off road is traction. We all know we need to upgrade our standard tyre and of course for our trips a quality set of mud terrain tyre is best but what size tyre should you run? When it comes to getting more traction, bigger is better. So we're running 35 inch tyres, the largest we can legally engineer for registration. Look at this standard tyre compared to a 35 inch muddy. You can see just how much more surface area of the tyre is in contact with the ground. The longer the footprint, the more traction you'll have. It's got to do with the greater length of their footprint. Bigger, taller tyres also mean your diffs and underbody sit higher off the ground, and with a taller sidewall, when you drop your tyre pressures, you can see all this extra rubber comes in contact with the track. That's going to give you a heap more grip. So Sam, what tyres did you choose, mate? So we've gone for the 35-inch Goodyear Wrangler Kevlar MTs. They've got a super aggressive tread pattern, and the sidewall is actually reinforced with Kevlar, which makes for excellent puncture resistance. Yeah, nice one. Now, obviously, we can't just bolt the 35s up to the vehicle straight away. There's no way they're going to fit. Here's the best way to check where your tyres might scrub. Jack your vehicle up so the wheels are off the ground, remove the coil springs and strut like this and fit your tyre. If you're fitting larger rubber like this, make sure you still have full range of motion when the vehicle's on its bump stops. That also means turning left and right as well. If you want to make a tyre this size clear, it has to clear when the vehicle's on its bump stops as well, as that's the maximum amount the tyre can travel. If you've got clearance through the full range of motion and you've also got clearance at the bump stops, it means you can fit this tyre. We've got a little bit of cosmetic chopping to do in the flares and on the inner guard, but other than that, we should be able to make it work. 35s aren't just taller, they're wider than standard. Look how they would have poked out the side of your wheel arches if it weren't for these flares. That's firstly illegal and an easy way to get defected. It's also going to allow the tyres to throw rocks and dirt, which can damage the sides of your four-wheel drive. There's a bunch of reasons why you need to upgrade your suspension. It'll give you better ride quality, give you more ground clearance when you're off-road, and it'll be able to handle the weight from all your accessories and gear. 
Your factory shocks aren't designed to work with stiffer springs and they also can't handle the heat from driving over rough terrain with excess weight. If there's one thing that you should consider, no matter what four-wheel drive you're building, it's weight. Coil and leaf springs are designed to carry a certain weight and it's essential to get the right rate of springs for your vehicle. For example, if you put some springs in that are designed to carry 500 kilos more than standard and you're not carrying that much, then your four-wheel drive will ride very harshly. On the other side, running a lighter rated spring with excess weight means the spring will be overloaded, it won't be able to do its job, and you can risk chassis damage and you'll lose ground clearance as well. If you pick a coil rated to carry all the gear you take to Cape York, it's gonna to be too stiff and ride horribly around town day to day when it's unladed. When it came time to choose springs for this build, we've got around about 350 kilos just in accessories added to the rear and around about 150 kilos or so for the front. So with that in mind, we've chosen a 400 kilo rated spring for the back, but we've also added airbags if we need to substitute a little bit of extra weight. The airbags are also gonna help us carry the extra weight so we don't lose ground clearance and smash into the bump stops when we're doing high speeds off-road. The trick with airbags is to get your springs set up to your weight first, then add airbags to assist, not to act as a main load carrying component. If you have to pump your airbags up to the max just to get your full drive to sit level, it firstly means that your springs aren't rated correctly to the load you're carrying, and it also means you can risk doing damage to your four-wheel drive. The problem is, an overinflated airbag essentially acts like a large bump stop, and that's one of the reasons people can bend their chassis because they inflate the airbag too much and don't have the spring doing the job. The airbags are great when you're varying the load in your four-wheel drive. When you're driving around town without gear, the coil springs can support the weight. When you add more weight to go long distance touring, the airbags help support the extra weight. The emphasis being on help. Here's another big tip for most of you IFS owners out there. When you lift your four wheel drive, it changes your suspension geometry, meaning your tire starts to go on an angle like this. This will make your vehicle ride and handle poorly and it'll wear your tires unevenly but here's how you fix it. This is an adjustable upper control arm. Adding an adjustable upper arm like this allows you to set up the arm to suit the increased height, therefore keeping your suspension working correctly. Not only are these arms stronger than standard, but the ball joint built into them is much stronger and designed to handle tougher off-road conditions and greater force from larger tyres and increased weight hitting rocks and wombat holes. With an upgraded arm, you can also get more travel from your suspension as it's less likely to bind like a factory arm would when it's lifted to the limit of its range. Well, there you go. We've gained about an extra 20 mil of droop just by adding this adjustable upper control arm. Now the main thing that will restrict travel is your shock and sway bar links, but it's nice to know that the arm isn't the limiting factor. Pretty much with every single IFS 4 drive across the board, when you lift them, you throw the alignment out a long way, and now we've added the adjustable arm, it's easy to rectify. Once your suspension and tyres are fitted, your wheel alignment is going to be out massively. The next step is to get a professional wheel alignment done so your tyres wear evenly and your vehicle handles like it should. This one mod will help stop your CVs from breaking. When you lift the front of an IFS four wheel drive, you increase the angle on the front CV joints. I've got one here to show you an example. In a factory four wheel drive, the front CV is nice and straight. When you install your suspension lift, it increases the angle on the CV. That puts more stress on the internal components and on the shaft. Then when you head off road, you can shock load the front wheels, which puts a whole bunch of stress and torque into the CV, which can cause them to break. For many of you, unless you're pushing your four-wheel drive hard, it won't really be an issue. But if this 200 was to go out on a trip with us like this, you can nearly bet it'll break a CV unless we flatten the axle out and put the angle of the CV joint back to normal. Because in an IFS vehicle, your front diff is hard mounted, it will physically move your front diff down, therefore decreasing the stress on your CVs. You do lose a little bit of height only under the diff or the cross member if you've got one, but it's a small price to pay to keep your CVs working within their limits. If you're keen on doing some tougher four wheel driving, another area that's important to consider is a locker. That said though, a lot of modern vehicles like the 200 series will come out of the factory with traction control, and it can be hard to determine which is better for your needs. As good as some of these systems are, 
Because they only start to work after a tyre has lost grip and spun, they're not as effective as a diff lock, which never allows the unladen wheel to spin in the first place. That slight loss of momentum you get while traction control realises there's slippage and it needs to kick in, makes it easier to get stuck. The big question is though, front or rear locker? Depending on your vehicle, we reckon one in the front makes the biggest difference off-road, particularly for IFS vehicles that like to lift front wheels. However, front lockers can put extra pressure on driveline components like CVs. For four-drive action trips though, we've found that a rear locker gives you the traction you need and is much less likely to cause any issues and damage. Put simply, no four-wheel drive will go away on a four-wheel drive action trip without some proper underbody armour. It's almost guaranteed to go home on a tow truck. Just take a look at how many important vehicle components there are that are low slung under this vehicle, ready to be hit on a large rock or a tree stump. Things like your front diff, engine sump, transmission, transfer case, and even low hanging exhaust components. If you want to get the protection you need, you need a good quality underbody armour kit that goes from front to back. This is one mod a lot of four-wheel drivers often overlook. It can actually cost you thousands in repairs if you're not careful. This is a factory diff breather. Think of it like a snorkel, but for your diffs. The way this works is, as you're driving, the driveline will heat up and the hot air inside here needs to escape. It does so through this breather. The problem is though, when you're out in the bush, if you drive through a deep water crossing or a deep bog hole, the rapid change in temperature will cause air to be sucked through this hose. But if this is underwater, the first thing it's gonna suck through is water. And when that mixes with your diff oil, you can ruin the internals. Fortunately, this is a real cheap and easy mod to fix. Basically, all you've got to do is extend this hose. A lot of four-wheel drivers run it up high into the engine bay, so water can't get in. Another handy tip when you are installing the breather, make sure you leave enough for the suspension to articulate. Otherwise, when you flex your vehicle up, it can pull the hose off the fitting. Fortunately, this vehicle's on a hoist right now, so the suspension's at full droop. So all I've got to do is leave a little bit of play in there and it should be sweet. Also, don't forget the breathers on your transmission and transfer case. There's breathers on these two and that same issue can occur, except it'll cost you twice as much to fix. We all know you need a snorkel on your four-wheel drive if you're planning to do any deep water crossings, but one of the most important things to remember when you're installing one is to make sure that the airbox is watertight too. Make sure you silicon here where the snorkel comes into the airbox. In some airboxes like this 200 series, you also need to fill holes like this to ensure it's watertight. This hole is designed to let water drain out of the airbox, but when the box is underwater, it'll suck water in, so seal it up. Some air intakes like the 200 also have problems with dust getting into the clean side of the airbox and into the engine. This will wear out components in your engine really quick and can even destroy your motor. An easy way to stop this is to run a bit of rubber grease on the rubber seal of your air filter. This seals it better and catches all the dust. One of the easiest ways to stop dust getting past the seal is to upgrade your airbox from the factory unit. The boys are putting this one from Moonlight Fabrications which bolts straight in. One of the first places you can hit off-road, no matter what four drive you've got, is this area right here behind the rear tyre. Particularly on some dual cab utes as well with a factory rear tub, this section is really prone to damage. One way to fix it is by adding a rear bar. They're not just great at protecting panels, but they also are a great spot for adding accessories to. Another problem that adding a rear bar will fix, particularly on a wagon like the 200, because we're running 35 inch tyres, we can't fit a full size spare under here anymore where the factory spare is, so we're going to add it onto the rear bar instead. A common mod is to add two spare 35 inch tyres to the back of your vehicle. Although, adding two spare 35s is a lot of weight for any rear bar to carry over rough roads and it adds a lot of weight a long way back on your four-wheel drive, which isn't the best for handling. For this 200, we're going to stick with one spare as it's so rare for us to damage more than one tyre in almost any trip we've ever done. The same goes with adding a set of sliders to the side of your four-wheel drive. Without them, you can smash the sill in here, which is really difficult to fix and sometimes you can't even open your door. A good set of sliders should have rock rash all over them and be beaten up. That means they're doing their job and it also means your sills are protected. If you have a low front approach angle, it essentially means that there's not enough clearance in front of your tyre, so the first thing you hit off road will be your bar or your front bumper. When choosing a bull bar, you can't really go wrong. 
However, we've gone with this one because of the brilliant approach angle it gives us, which is essential for four wheel driving up rock steps. You don't have to be a tough four wheel driver to have a winch. You don't want to be in a situation where you've got nobody to help recover you and you're wishing you had a winch. It's the best mod you can add to your four wheel drive to make you worry less. It'll also make you more confident to explore an adventure away from the crowds, and who doesn't love that? The front bull bar also gives us a spot to mount all our accessories to. So now the suspension and drive line are done on the 200, we're starting to install the touring setup in the back of the vehicle. The boys have gone with a drifter draw setup in the back of the 200, and the main reason for that is these drawers don't use runners. The two main advantages of that is you get more draw because there's not a runner taking up space, and you save a little bit of extra weight because these use Teflon slides and move along really nicely. Makes the back of the 200 look really schmick. And we've also chucked a clear view easy slide on the top. This isn't bolted down yet. We're gonna uh, figure out where we wanna mount it and then get it all set up, but it's coming along really well so far. These drawers bolt into the back of the 200, which is real simple for an easy install. But one of the other things I love is it has a slide out table. Now you can do one or two things. You can pull this out at camp if you're cooking for the night. But the other thing I love, and I watched Sean do this down at Tassie, which I thought was really cool. When we stopped for lunch, he just pulled the table out like this and cook on it, do all his stuff, and then when he was done, slide it back away, and it just made for a really simple, quick, and easy way to make your lunch. Just starting to install all the 12 volt gear in the back of the 200 now, and when it comes to 12 volt, there are a bunch of things you need to consider, but some of the two main questions you need to ask yourself are, what do you need to charge, and how long can you go before you need to charge your vehicle again? When you answer those two questions, you'll be able to determine the size of the charger you need to run and also what accessories you need like inverters and things like your battery size as well. Knowing the amount of amps each of your 12 volt products like your fridge and light straw is the first step to knowing what size charger to run. Now the boys have added one battery in the back of the 200 for now, mainly because it's gonna be doing a few shorter trips to start with. And the other reason is it keeps the weight down as well. But down the track, because they've added in the Manager 30, if they wanna add another battery for bigger trips like Cape York, they can. A couple of tips for when you're installing your 12 volt setup are, you need to make sure you use the appropriate size cable for the size of the charger and the distance the cable's gotta run. So you limit the risk of voltage drop. Most 12 volt gear you fit will tell you in the manual what size cable and fusing they recommend. On all connections, you need to make sure you solder and heat shrink and crimp terminals where possible. This is important because on rough roads and four wheel driving, you need all of your cable connections to be as strong as possible. Poorly done connections will come apart and you'll lose charging power to your battery. And above all, make sure you use the right size fuses as close to the battery as possible on each end of the charger. So let's say you short circuit a wire and a fuse pops. The power from the battery is only running that tiny distance to the fuse block, not all the way down the cable, making it much safer. The boys have chosen the Red Arc Manager 30 for the back of the 200, and one of the reasons they've done that is because it does a bunch of things in one. It's a DC charger, a solar charger, a 240 volt charger, a dual battery isolator, and it comes with a remote battery monitor as well. That's really handy because you can put that monitor up the front in the cab or down the back of the drawer so you can always see what your batteries are doing. All these mods are gonna make the four wheel drive an absolute animal both off-road and at camp, but they all add weight. But there's a couple of key considerations you've got to think about when you're adding weight like this to help counteract it. There's two major upgrades you should consider to counteract the extra weight you've added. For starters, standard brakes are fine if your vehicle is standard. However, fully loaded will be about five to 600 kilos heavier than standard. We've also fitted taller, heavier 35 inch mud tires, which will take a longer distance to stop. It's good to then consider a front brake upgrade with better performing rotor and pad setup. Braided brake lines are also a good upgrade because they don't expand like rubber ones and they help reduce how hard you need to press the brake pedal to get your four wheel drive to stop in time. While the V8 on the 200 has plenty of power, with the added weight, a performance upgrade will help make it accelerate, pull up hills and be an off-road animal. You've also got more low down power, which will make four wheel driving a lot easier. We've also added a three inch mandrel bent exhaust. You've got to hear how it sounds now. Wow. 
We're only one day away from getting the big 200 ready for the track, so it's time for some last minute accessories. As you can see, the dash of the 200 is still apart. That's because I'm just installing the UHF at the moment. One of the things, particularly in modern vehicles, is space is a bit of an issue for mounting a UHF, and it's not really that good to drill into a nice new dash. You don't want to ruin it. So what we've done is the transceiver for the UHF is actually mounted out of the way under the center console, and then we've run the lead for the speaker mic up to uh, under the radio here. So it means we can just plug in the speaker mic just here and mount it wherever we want to. Another little handy tip, if you do have a modern vehicle like the 200 and you're looking for a UHF, try to find one with all the controls in the speaker mic. The reason for that is the transceiver itself is likely going to be much smaller and compact, which means you can mount it out of the way and put the speaker mic wherever you want. To get it trip ready, we're throwing on the roof rack, lighting, awning and more. Now the vehicle's done, it's time to get it engineered and ready for the tracks. Obviously when you do any major modifications to your vehicle, one of the most important areas you need to look at is engineering. If you do any serious modifications and you don't look at engineering, you can potentially be driving around an illegal and uninsured four-wheel drive. So that said, if you are going to do some major modifications and you want to look at engineering, a couple of tips, speak to an engineer before you even turn a spanner on your vehicle. That way you can decide with the engineer what option works best and he'll also advise you on options that you can actually do. Some modifications you just flat out can't do in Australia. So you need to speak to a reputable engineer before you even work on the vehicle. Another one is allow for a budget that suits engineering to make sure your vehicle is certified. It's usually gonna cost a couple of grand to get a en uh, vehicle engineered properly. So make sure you set aside a good budget for that. And finally, it's the age old saying, do it once, do it right. That particularly applies for engineering as well. If you are gonna look at serious modifications to your vehicle, like putting larger tires on or any suspension modifications, make sure you take the time to do it properly. Otherwise, it's just a waste of time. Another thing to keep in mind is engineering laws can vary considerably from state to state. Just because something's legal in one state, doesn't exactly mean it'll be legal in another state. There are also some modifications that you can't get engineered at all, so if you're not sure, make sure you check with your local authorities first. Mate, built the big 200 in a week and then just put it to the test in the Wattos, what do you reckon? Mate, it's handled the tough stuff, better than I could have expected. Definitely, and guys, we've tried to prove that no matter what four-wheel drive you own, whether it's a big budget 200 series, or you've just bought yourself your pride and joy $500 GQ, the principles of building a four-wheel drive remain the same. Yeah, that's exactly right, mate, and like you said, it doesn't matter whether it's a big budget build or just, you know, you're just getting started, spares boxes, just about got everything you could possibly want. Thanks for watching, guys, and if you have any tips that uh, you've picked up along the way from building your own vehicle, leave them in the comments below, because I'm sure Sam might need a few tips for building his 80. Absolutely. Cheers, guys. <laughs>